In this lecture, we're going to introduce you to the Z distribution. And the Z distribution is also known as a standard normal curve. Um, it's going to serve as sort of our backbone as we start to understand the concepts of hypothesis testing and inferential statistics. So we're, in this brief lecture, we're going to talk about the usefulness of the Z distribution, um, some of the primary characteristics of the Z distribution, and we're also going to introduce you to a couple important z-scores that are going to stick with us as we as we continue on through the course. Um, the readings that go along with this particular lecture are chapter 3, module 6, and then also chapter 4, module 7. And chapter 4 is more corresponds more to the, the next lecture that we'll have, but it kind of gives you an idea if you want to read ahead a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about the z-distribution. So what is the z-distribution and why is it useful to us? The z-distribution is a, a normal distribution. And we've talked about normal distributions in prior lectures, right? You remember those, those symmetric, unimodal, bell-shaped curves. But normal distributions are not, there's not just one normal distribution. They are actually a family of distributions that vary in size and shape. And the key thing that, that makes them different are where their central point is, that's the mean or mu, as well as the width of the particular normal distribution, the standard deviation or sigma. And as we talked about in previous lectures, they all share those unimodal bell-shaped characteristics, but in order to further utilize the characteristics of the normal distribution in statistics, uh, statisticians have standardized the values of normal distributions in order to give us an idea of the area under the curve. And you may recall also from our discussion about the sampling distribution and the mean, one of the things with statistics, and especially as we start moving into inferential statistics and hypothesis testing, is knowing what's the probability of getting a particular sample or the probability of getting a particular finding in a research study. Well, in order to understand this, we need to have some mathematics behind the probability. And one of the things that the Z distribution allows us to do, because it is a standardized distribution, we can start to analyze what we call the area under the curve to figure out the probability or likelihood of getting certain outcomes or certain values. So let's talk about a couple of the terms we're gonna see. So let's look at this blue uh, um, bullet point here. So by standardizing values, we can get an idea of the area under the curve that are comparable across different normal distributions, regardless of their mean or their standard deviation value. So by standardizing everything, we can start to get this concept of, do I have a rare outcome? Do I have a common outcome? Um, what is the likelihood of getting a value higher than what I observed or lower than what I observed? And so some of the things that we're going to have to start to understand is one is we need to understand what standardized values are all about. Standardized values, in this sense, simply re refer to the value of what we call Z scores within the Z distribution. And I give you an example of one of the formulas for computing z-scores. So if you look down to the lower left-hand side of the slide, you'll see this formula where it says z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. So what this shows you is how we could take any raw score from any sort of normally distributed phenomenon and then figure out what somebody's z-score is. So let's imagine I have a group of students who take an exam. Everyone in the class has their raw score. So if the exam is out of 100 points and I've got, you know, say 50 people in a class taking it, I have 50 different raw scores. Everyone got a different score or their own unique score on the exam. But in order to standardize those values and figure out how they, how they performed relative to one another, relative to the mean of the class, we can standardize their scores by turning their raw score into a z-score. So what you see here with this formula is you take x, 
x is anybody's raw score, their original score. So with my example, that would be their score on the midterm. Um, so if there was 100 points on an exam and somebody scored 73, boom, I'd put it right in there for x. Then I would subtract the mean, and the mean would also be in the raw units of the actual variable. I would insert the mean, and then I would divide it by the standard deviation for that variable. So these are all, you know, some of the descriptive statistics we've talked about are coming back to us. So by taking a raw score and then subtracting the mean, dividing by the standard deviation, I end up with a Z score. So the answer I would get would be the Z. The Z is the standardized value in this example. It would be the standardized value for that particular student. So that's one of the formulas we're going to be seeing in the next couple lectures. And we'll go into more detail um, once we get to those lectures. But I just want to kind of introduce you to this concept of standardizing values. Then if we look at the bottom right-hand side of this slide where it says area under the curve, you'll see I have a... a brief snapshot of a portion of a table that is known as the proportion of area under the standard normal curve for values of z. Because I can standardize any raw score and turn it into a z score, once a score is turned into a z score, I can figure out the probability of observing values that are larger than it or less than it and things of that nature. So it allows me to get an idea of like just how rare or common a certain score might be. Um, one of the things that many of us have experienced probably in high school and even through um, grade school was when we do like standardized, you know, state testing. And then after you did your test in some subject, you may get a letter in the mail or your teacher may give it to you and they would say something like, you know, you're in the 78th percentile or you're in the 94th percentile. Where did those percentiles come from? Those are all about z-scores. They tell you how well you did relative to other people in that sample. And that's kind of what we're seeing. So for right now though, we're just trying to give you the brief introduction. So keep in mind of how we start to compute standardized values in order to create this Z distribution, these Z scores, and that's the formula that you see on the left. And then this table on the right is a useful table for us to be able to figure out the probability of getting certain Z scores. And it's so important, this area under the curve table, that I have actually posted on Beachboard um, a document that is a full document that has this, and I've, I've labeled it the Z and T distribution table. So make sure you keep your eyes open in emails and look on Beachboard for that. But that's going to be an important sort of, you know, side piece that you want to have as you go through the rest of this lecture, as well as the next couple lectures that follow. So what are the characteristics of this standard normal curve, of this Z distribution? Well, as you can see from the little graphic on this slide, the Z distribution looks like a normal distribution. Why? Because in fact, it is a normal distribution, but it is the standardized normal distribution. And by standardizing it, what happens is we fix the mean and the standard deviation values. So let me say that one more time. Even though the Z distribution looks like any other normal distribution, it is unique because it is, a stan it is the standard normal distribution. And what do we mean by standard? We mean that we have fixed the mean and standard deviation values. So when we look at the Z distribution, we are no longer talking about the units of the original variable. So whether the units of the original variable were points on an exam, or number of prior arrests within a sample, or somebody's age and years. No, those units have been removed. And in fact, what we have are standardized values or z-scores. So the z-distribution looks symmetric, unimodal, and bell-shaped, just like any other normal curve. But it's been standardized, and I feel like a broken record now, and I'll try to stop saying that as far as repeating it. But yes, it has been standardized, and that means that the mean of the Z distribution is always, always going to be zero. 
the standard deviation of the z distribution will always be one. And the values along that z distribution are called z scores. And you may have caught this from a, a few seconds ago, but why are they called z scores? Well, we have stripped the raw units away. These values are now, and if there's, if you want to talk about any sort of units or ways to interpret z scores, they are interpreted as the number of standard deviations that a particular score is from the mean. If you have a negative z-score, you are below the mean. If you have a positive z-score, you are above the mean. How far below or above the mean you happen to be depends upon your z-score. And then your z-score, so a z-score of one means you are one standard deviation above the mean. A z-score of negative two would mean that you are two standard deviations below the mean. What are some of the important z-scores that we want to work with? Okay, so on this slide, what we have here is I'm starting off with something that I mentioned in a previous lecture. You see they're up there in blue and, you know, in quotes and italics where I say, approximately two-thirds of all values are within one standard deviation of the mean. And you may recall from our prior lecture about the standard deviation that I threw this sort of canned statistical language out there that approximately two thirds of all values are within one standard deviation of the mean. Well, where did that come from? Where did I come up with that language? This, that sort of phrase comes back to characteristics of the, the Z distribution. And in fact, that nice little area under the curve or area under the standard normal curve chart that is available in many, many textbooks. Um, they're often printed or presented different ways, but they all contain the same type of information. Um, and that's what I've posted on Beachboard for you and what I call that Z and T distributions um, chart. That allows us to get the, the precise amount measurement of the area under the curve. So let's see how I got to that approximately two thirds of, of all values are within one standard deviation of the mean. Well, if I look at my area under the curve chart, and just as a reminder, this is the one that's posted on Beachboard. You saw it on the previous slide, a, a snapshot of it. I have it circled on this slide in red down at the bottom. So when you open it and find it on Beachboard, it should look somewhat like that. And it's a little bit, it's not just a half page, it's actually two pages long. But what it does, it gives us the precise area, amount of area under the curve for any particular z-score. And so if I look up a z-score of one, meaning one standard deviation away from the mean, and then I look at what is the area under the curve that exists between the mean and a z-score of 1.00, using that area under the curve chart, you'll find that it is exactly 34.13%. So what you see shaded here in red in our z-score distribution, that column that is shaded out there with little red diagonal bars represents 34.13% of the area under the curve. And you'll note that it is limited by the mean of zero and the value, a z-score of positive 1.00 or one standard deviation above the mean. Now, how I found that 34.13%, don't panic if you have, if this is, seems awkward or strange to you, in the next lecture, I'm gonna go into more detail about how we look up and use those numbers in that area under the curve chart. For this lecture, I just wanna introduce you to the basic idea of it. So don't, don't get too far ahead of yourself. So 34.13% of the area under the curve exists between the mean and a z-score of positive one. Well, since the z distribution is symmetrical, bell-shaped, we know that the area between zero, the mean, and positive one, is also gonna be the exact sort of proportion of area that falls between zero and negative one, right? Because it's a mirror image, it's symmetrical. So if I take 34.13 
and multiply it by two, I get 68.26%. So therefore, 68.26% of the total area under the curve exists between Z scores of negative 1.0 and positive 1.0. So how does this all tie back into my quote that I have at the top of this slide? Well, 68.26 is roughly two thirds, right? I know that technically two thirds is 66.666, et cetera, but it's roughly two thirds. And that 68.26 in the Z distribution represents the area between one standard deviation below the mean, negative one, and one standard deviation above the mean, positive one. So if I compute the total area under the curve that falls between negative one and positive one, sure enough, I find out that approximately two thirds of all values are within one standard deviation of the mean. Another very, very important uh, Z-score that we need to understand is the value of positive negative 1.96. So before I even go into explaining what's going on on this slide, make sure any statistics student needs to memorize over and over again, do not forget, make sure you know the value of Z equals 1.96. And more importantly, it's negative and positive 1.96. But a Z score of 1.96 is arguably the most important z-score that we will use throughout this course. Now, why is negative and positive 1.96, why are those z-scores important? Well, the, the reality is, is that 95%, exactly 95% of the total area under the z-distribution exists between those two values, between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. And once again, how do we find this out? You use that area under the curve chart that I've mentioned briefly, and then I will go into much more detail with some examples in our next lecture about how to use that chart. But the key takeaway is knowing that exactly, not even a fraction, but exactly, 95% of the total area under the curve falls between the z-scores of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. And so we see that. If you look at the blue, I have sort of roughly shown you where a negative 1.96 would be, as well as where a positive 1.96 would be in that z-distribution. Then with the red lines and red marking, I've sort of highlighted or marked off the area that falls between a negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. And that is the area where exactly 95% of the total area under the curve exists. So when this is gonna come back to us, especially when we get into hypothesis testing and inferential statistics. When I introduce hypothesis testing, we're gonna to refer to this area between those two z-scores as the common area. These are what we might think of as likely outcomes. And if it helps, think about when we did that sampling distribution of the mean example, right? Where we have people living on a desert island collecting coconuts, right? And I said, well, if as a researcher, if I know and I go and I just collect information from a sample, there's a good chance it's not going to be a perfect reflection of the population. But I want to know, is it a pretty decent reflection or is it a really odd or rare sample? So this common area that falls between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 is what we would call typically common outcomes. And yes, I know it, it covers a lot of area, but that's just the nature of statistics. Just roll with it, right? So any outcome or any sample or any finding that falls within that common area, we would say, okay, maybe it's a little different from the true population mean or whatever we're hypothesizing. But it's not enough for us to get excited or to say that we have, quote unquote, a significant outcome or a significant finding, other terms that we'll talk about as we go forward. All right. So what's outside of this common area? Well, we still have some area under that curve that exists. 
right? So what we see here in purple, when you look at that chart, I still have sort of marked off the areas of what we'd call the two tails of the curve. So if there's exactly 95% in the red common area, well, what's left? If there's 100% total area under the curve, you take 100 minus 95, and sure enough, there's 5% left in that purple area. So 5% of the total area under the curve exists, what we would say, as beyond positive negative 1.96, meaning more extreme than positive and negative 1.96. And since, once again, we have a symmetric um, distribution, we can split that 5% equally into two. So there's 2.5% below a z-score of negative 1.96, and there's also 2.5% above a positive z-score of 1.96. And so this, these two tails, as we will, we will refer to them as, each hold 2.5% of the total area under the curve. These areas, when combined, the two tails are combined to what we're going to refer to as the rare area of the distribution. And so once again, if we have a sample and we want to say, do I have a common sample? Do I have something or do I have something that's very rare and unique? It's all going to be, it's going to come down to, well, where does it fall within the distribution? What was the likelihood of me observing that particular value? So if things fall within the red, they are in the common area. Nothing exciting, nothing to see here. However, if we end up with a result with our statistical analysis where we end up out in that purple area, aha, now we're out in the rare, unique area, and this is where we're going to start using terms like we have statistical significance, we have a significant finding, uh, we have something that is unique, something that is rare, and these are all terms that will come back to us as we get deeper into hypothesis testing. And so, as I wrap up this lecture, one of the things is sort of also to tie back other concepts that we've covered is you may recall when we talked about the shape of a distribution. And one of the things we talked about was skewness. And I said, well, we can have positive skewness, negative skewness, right? That's where we, we deviate from a bell-shaped curve and we tend to have one tail that is longer with some extreme values and, and pulls the curve in one direction, right? So we had talked about skewness, positive and negative skewness. But I also mentioned the idea of how do we determine whether or not we have quote unquote significant skewness. And you may recall that in order to figure that out, we took the value of a skewness statistic and we divided it by the standard error of skewness. And then I said, if the answer you got was less than negative two or greater than positive two, aha, that was an indicator that you had a significant amount of skewness. Now, where did that negative and positive two come in? It's all right here. I pretty much just rounded 1.96 to 2 and to make it easier at the time we presented it. But it all sort of shows you how things tie back together. When we talk about significant findings, the thing that we're looking for is do we have sort of rare outcomes when we actually conduct our statistical analysis? And so a lot of these things, you're going to see them starting to overlap and come back together. So for now, we're going to leave it at that for this particular lecture. In our next lecture, we're going to go deeper into the z-distribution. We're going to work on practicing several things. We're going to work on how do we actually translate raw scores into z-scores using the formula similar to what we saw earlier in this presentation. So we're going to talk about how do we calculate z-scores. Then we're also going to talk about how we use z-scores to understand the concept of relative standing. Like, where do, why, why would I ever want to use a z-score? And so we'll go into that. And then finally, we'll bring out this area under the curve chart that I've referred to a couple times in this lecture and show in more detail how do we use it. How do we come up with knowing that exactly 95% of the area under the curve falls between 1.96 and negative 1.96? Um, how do I figure out the area under the curve that is above or below any particular z-score? And we'll go through some examples with that. So I look forward to seeing you or hearing you um, at the next lecture and take care.